we today we have with us apramaya radhakrishna india's local microblogging platform then we have with us rajesh sahani founder gsf accelerator a leading technology accelerator in india we also have with us sandeep agarwal founder and ceo drew welcome everyone so sir uh, let me ask uh, sandeep uh top three customer challenges you know faced by d2c companies in india today the marketing when you create any brand the marketing has uh, you know marketing has always been uh, one of the most challenging part also rajesh has a seasoned uh, investor plus entrepreneur will share with you that's what probably he sees on every company's uh, pnl right i mean does not matter whether you are building a brand or a saas company maybe less so in saas company or technology company consumer yeah. net your marketing your marketing is going to be in proportionately higher at least for the first four six or maybe up to 10 years uh, and uh, unless unless uh, you got unless, unless you got very lucky and somehow hit the hit the uh, you know hit the home run with virality fomo and all other cool things which can glory freight your brand without having to spend money and nowadays you know with a with a d2c uh, uh you know i mean d2c uh, you know there uh, you know i think uh, i can talk more about consumer internet but uh, but in terms of uh, you know d2c uh, what is happening is that these companies are uh, almost like a rebellious version of uh, old fmcg i mean you know i sometimes wonder why don't we call nike or reebok and adidas as d2c and i'm sure rajesh will have a much more philosophical explanation for that uh, you know but i think uh, you know having a startup approach to creating a brand right uh, ha- having maybe a contract manufacturing having a marketing which is not dependent on atl and btl and probably thinking of new format of internet advertising could be reels could be tiktok could be short video could be influencer marketing i think those are the uh, right. those are the things and if though if these d2c brand uh, do not take out marketing as a percentage of their gross revenue to an entirely different lower level which was uh, right at they they really can't create a d2c brand so you know higher dependency on a di- digital distribution new format of marketing contract manufacturing influencer and many other ways to endorse your brand those are the new way of marketing and i think that's that's what makes something as a d2c brand all right so rajesh what do you have to say about it i think sandeep just said that you must have a philosophical answer for it uh, no no it's a very simple observation i think uh, we will have million to see brand i think there's a revolution happening where the uh, every housewife every student every young entrepreneur uh, has now the ability to create a brand uh, and i think it's happening primarily for two reasons one i think manufacturing is got much more sorted out now contract manufacturing so you can outsource your manufacturing uh, you can do your formulation you can do your brand so you don't need from day one to create your own manufacturing so that is one secondly uh, distribution which was traditional now has become uh, more and more uh, widespread a uh, lot more new channels are available and most important you can sell directly to consumer and finally i think consumer himself or herself is not now any more on traditional media right they are now on all kind of new media from share chat to uh, you know uh, instagram to name it to uh, they they're going all over so uh, newer forms of engaging with consumers are becoming available so if you combine these three uh, this is a very powerful trend uh, where you will see more and more experiments happening so i i, I can see uh, a million d2c brands uh, coming out because people are inherently very very creative they they have much better need understanding of consumer needs than corporates who have to do a lot of research and then they are bound by their traditional channel conflicts and um, you know legacy brands so they have inherently less uh, ability to be agile 
So a very vibrant D2C economy is coming. So now let's see, understand the consumer. I think that is the main focus. Consumer is also uh, now more experimental than he has ever been before. He is willing to try out new brands. He is willing to listen to new age uh, influencers. So, uh, so what what's really happening is this consumer is no longer a prisoner of 30 second TV commercial, which used to happen. Now he needs to be engaged in very, very different way. Uh, and th that's why if you see the shape of e-commerce, which is the topic today, which is becoming conversational, which is becoming video led, which is also becoming social, you've seen what has happened on Misho and City Mall, where I'm an investor. Uh, and then uh, the engagement with the consumer, the whole paradigm is changing. So I think it's a very big thing. It's not a small thing. Uh, uh, and some big brands out of this D2C sort of experiment are already beginning to see them, show themselves out. The Mama is one, Sugar Cosmetics, in different categories. So I'm very optimistic. I think uh, it's a great new opportunity for entrepreneurs to not only invest in D2C brands, but also invest in D2C infrastructure and ecosystem. So I, I'll come back I, uh, on more, more thoughts, but I get other panelists can also contribute at this point. Hi, Rohit. So the, we, were, uh, we were discussing about the, the top three customer challenges faced by D2C companies. So uh, if, if I have to butt into the discussion, right, I, think, I think there are two points uh, or, or, uh, that I have seen uh, it's either the question also comes down to who's the customer, right? If you're talking about the top 100, 200, 300 million people, the, the challenges are very, very different. Right? If you if you move on to, let's say the next 500 million people, uh, the problem is entirely different. Uh, the last 500 million people are just not connected. So uh, I think that again has been a very important question in terms of who really is the consumer because the problems change drastically from one, set to the other, you call it India, Bharat, Bharat 1, Bharat 2. I think we can keep naming them uh, in, in whatever way, shape and form. Uh, but I think the larger problems across the board can be categorized into, I mean, uh, digital infrastructure, connectivity, reliability of it, affordability of it, et cetera, is, is one big uh, constraint slash challenge uh, that exists across the board. Uh, the second is, and as Rajesh said, right, uh, there's a possibility of a million uh, D2C brands, uh, but the second problem that starts with a million D2C brands coming in is the discovery of it, right? Uh, how do you discover relevant brands' products, uh, discover relevance between the products, uh, so on and so forth. So discovery always becomes one big uh, part. And then the third also becomes the, the trust factor of it, which always continues in, in any kind of... Uh, D2C shopping, e-commerce, uh, so on and so forth. As as the, uh, you know, when Amazon aggregates a million brands, we trust Amazon. But as the D2C brands start coming in, uh, we still have to sort of go through the trust journey of each one of those brands. So, Apramiya, uh, what sectors would be in high demand in post-COVID era? What do you think? Healthcare, uh, you know, across the spectrum will, will become high demand. Uh, just because, you know, Health has become not so preventive healthcare before COVID. I think much fewer people were, you know, so bothered about keeping themselves healthy on a uh, everyday basis. I think post COVID, you know, everybody wants to be in their best state of health, right? Uh, so I think in healthcare, preventive healthcare will definitely grow uh, big time. And of course, uh, you know, whether it is keeping a track of your health. Uh, right. Okay. What are your, uh, how do you monitor your health, uh, booking tests or, you know, even, um, you know, startups like uh, ultra human, I think raised around the funding, uh, which is real time tracking of your health. So one is prevent health. One is tracking of health. And of course, you know, if you do fall sick, uh, more innovation on, you know, how to get, uh, immediate, help from doctors or whoever else it is, right? So I think all these, so healthcare is a broad word, but you know, all the sub-segments of healthcare will, will definitely do very well. Um, information, uh, you know, new communities, platforms, uh, which 
uh, not just do transactions for health, but also uh, allow people to come together for information on health and exchange of ideas on health. So all of this uh, will definitely do well, in my opinion. So healthcare would be a big bet. So, uh, Sandeep, uh, despite the boom in consumer tech and you talked about discovery, is there a deficit in tech which needs to be plugged in? Uh, absolutely, uh, Puneet. Uh, you know, this is a very early age, uh, early days in technology, right? Um, you know, uh, in 1750, uh, industrial revolution happened in Europe and that tilted the wealth for the next 200 years. Uh, from China and India, which accounted for 70% of global GDP to less than 5%, and Europe probably from less than 5% to 40%. Similarly, uh, digital economy, new set of technologies are changing the world. And internet, the way we know, is only 27 year old. And while it has brought very profound impact, uh, right, it is still early, right? We are talking about maybe some categories have significantly moved online, such as travel or jobs, uh, right? And, uh, you know, which are 70, 80% penetrated. I run room where categories less than 1% penetrated. And then you have various type of categories in between. But this is, uh, this is very early, early days, right? And so, uh, you know, within internet, we just discussed D2C. D2C is a very brand focused business, but it would not have evolved in its own current avatar without what internet has to offer, whether it is ability to sell on marketplace, ability to have discovery through the internet and bloggers and bloggers and influencers. So I think it is just in the early days, uh, you know, uh, uh, Apramya mentioned about some of the things which have become more important after uh, COVID, which I completely agree. But you know, you literally, I would say almost everything is up for grab where technological innovations uh, can bring, uh, you know, wonderful things, right? I mean, this is a, so, so I would say, you know, I don't want to go into terms of, you know, artificial intelligence, virtual reality, uh, IoT and, and crypto and so on. But all I'm saying is very simple in a very simple manner if you look at everything we consume as a consumers, everything is going to have its own share of digitization, right? And this is just in a nine inning game. Maybe we are just talking about the set, second, second inning. And you know, uh, most of the traditional businesses, right? Uh, right in for first 15, 20 years, they, you know, when the internet revolution was more pronounced in America, they could not even tell what just happened right from a bookstore to electronic store, one by one, everything changed. Who would have thought a 60 year old almighty Walmart, this quarter Amazon officially in terms of revenue became bigger than Walmart, right? And, you know, I'm seeing now, you know, I'll complete 10 years in India, I founded two companies. And I think now the India is there where US was in 1995, 98 in terms of dot com, right? So, so I think it's just a, a, a uh, Puneet, I'll let other to add, but you know this is uh, this is uh, a very big revolution, similar to industrial revolution, and in next thirty years, it's going to change almost everything: how we manufacture, how we discover, how we buy, and how we consume. That's really a wonderful insight. Thank you, Sandeep. Uh, we also have with us uh, Naveen Joshua. Hi, Naveen. Hi, hi. hi. Yeah. So. Naveen, would you like to take ahead the conversation with them? Thanks for holding forth in the meantime. Uh, I have had a conversation with uh, at least most of the panelists prior to this. So I'd love to. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I just had another question from uh, Sandeep, uh, you know, more from the Droom experience in terms of, uh, you know, uh, COVID and, and, and the impact of, you know, high value purchases and, and you know, uh, what have they seen because you know I, I see there's a lot of data science uh, driven in the marketplace so since the topic is more uh, you know tech enablement and the consumer moving in that direction uh, I hear great things about uh, how Droom has brought in more transparency for the consumer that instead of a challenge it has actually become a big benefit in terms of your AI engine for fair pricing 
uh, or you know the 1100 point checklist or the database of the history of the vehicle that actually gives more empowerment to the consumer uh, and so tech could actually not just be a challenge to surmount but actually a, a, a big uh, boost uh, for the used car uh, or automobile segment yeah no, absolutely so so naveen um, you know look uh, the way doom offers automobile buying and selling that's not how human being bought automobile for last 140 years i think uh, maybe india had its first car maybe around 1980 or 85 right i mean this is not how people bought and sold car so obviously uh, this is this is a big challenge and right and it's a, and it's very very early stage for this category to move online so everything which you just highlighted if we had not done that there is no way we would see even us you know denting uh, even a little bit in terms of our ability to accelerate digital adoption of automobile buying and selling but let me just quickly say three things number one yes this is this category has five or six characteristics which make it very different from buying a mobile phone electronic computer clothing shoes and accessories online number one it is high touch and feel second yeah. it is a big ticket item so third is it is uh, it is a uh, low propensity to buy fourth uh, is the regret of going wrong is not just a cancellation of an order uh, but it is a losing your peace of mind uh, right and and one more is that uh, one more is that in in long run everything is reversible in life but in short to mid term if you bought an automobile and you want to reverse it it is not a good news because of that it is much more harder for this category to move online right but if you look at india has a very high cost of capital so anytime you do touch capital expenditure or working capital you can lose your shirt if you are not mathematically inclined or you are not into high margin business or you don't have uh, like you know or you don't measure everything right second is india has a very expensive real estate like you know we feel that everything in industrialized country got to be more expensive because of per capita income but reality is if you look at the retail almost every retail category if you look at the rental paid by an indian retailer divide by revenue generated from the same physical center is so much higher in india right third is independent of what you're willing to pay india does not have a large format modern retailing right i think nowadays see zara and couple of other retail stores which can be really big but they are still i don't know 10000 20000 square feet but india does not have a half million square feet where even you have 3000 visitor car parking and you can spend next 3 hour even have to buy a pizza to because you spend so much time buying so so india does not offer all those things right but because now you see uh, you know one is india does not offer this but then you have this category where people are high touch and feel so how do you solve it and you know that technology is the only way to solve it so we created a marketplace where we are harnessing inventory by 20700 auto dealers and that is like roughly 1 million listings india's largest physical retailer also will not have more than 30 40 cars you can get 1.1 million listings right and then if i am selling you a car i have incentive to sell you at a high price right because i have to now solve for higher gross margin but when a marketplace sells you an item they focus on trade velocity rather than higher margin so that means you can get lower price and then you know when i started shop clues the problem was last mile merchants did not know how to ship an item how to pack which courier company to work with what is a you know a tracking number none of these were there so i solved that problem but in room there was you know how you mentioned like you know uh, pricing a all item is like pulling a number from the hat right second is how do i know the exact condition of the vehicle it's not brand new third is what about the documentation right what is what about is it has a hypothecation and i don't did not know about it i buy it and then hdfc shows up that that car belonged to me right. so we built right. we we used uh, just to you know i'll just wrap up by saying that you know we use technology data science to solve all these problems so we created a pricing engine we created an inspection engine we created a history engine and now we are building massively uh, our delivery so we can bring a car at your doorstep on a flatbed truck filled with a balloon and and cake that is the only way because the physical store can never give you what see indian consumer is now no different than a consumer in new york chicago shanghai or tokyo right but their physical equivalent is not giving them so we are leapfrogging and we are offering a much more innovative solution 
and and still very early days it's like you know less than 1% is online but we are we are placing a bet that 5 to 7% will be online but clearly corona uh, we did not want corona to be the reason but corona clearly accelerated adoption of our category right right thanks atan very interesting insight from a different uh, consumer tech aspect uh, talking about cars and vehicles i'll just uh, you know on a lighter note bring in uh, rajesh ji uh, i remember and he may not uh, about 5 6 years back meeting him at a gurgaon office and he was an avid cyclist at that time you know i'm not sure in all these years if he's still cycling but uh, a lot has moved in the india consumer tech space in that time uh, rajesh ji so your thoughts if you're not already come in on that no no totally i think uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, what we have witnessed in last 10 years is monumental uh, and look a lot of things that uh, were hindering us in enabling commerce have got sorted out uh, of course everyone knows about geo and 4g but i think the payments was a crucial roadblock uh, which now is uh, i'm amazed at the ways in which sort of payment industry has evolved and changed and continues to launch new startups right so is crazy what's happening there across the yeah. world so uh, i think uh, it's it's uh, payments solving for payments micro payments uh, has been a very very big sort of innovation on the back of upi uh, which sure. is government enabled so uh, those were the macro changes but i think uh, third we solved for the capital right i had uh, fears when chinese were banned Uh, last year uh, january february things for sort of three four months i thought there will be a choking of capital into indian but what has happened in the covid time is exactly the opposite correct uh, the taps have really opened for indian startup uh, there is no limit to the size and amount and with the rapidity with with, with the rounds and uh, i normally when i started investing 2010 you would budget for 2 3 years before the next round happens so you start with seed round you say okay series will happen 3 years or 18 months from now i think now we're talking about months every 3 months companies are able to raise a new round and it's it this this the capital has been solved for india both domestic and i think international and finally i think there is a change in consumer behavior monumental change uh, i think indian consumer has moved massively online uh, across the ages it's not just the youngsters now uh, my my wife <laughs> tells me about new sites uh, sitageeta.com chidia.com <laughs> i know where she buys look at the rise of nika i think it's an amazing marketplace that has been built Uh, for women uh, shopping and discovering new products uh, so uh, i think all of that has come together is an amazing feat uh, the consumer is the key i think always consumer is always evolving uh, consumer is always challenging the uh, companies to come out with newer innovative solutions and and the pace of innovation is not slowing it's actually actually growing it's like even in the room space we have what six seven marketplaces and the market is so big that it seems like that it can take one or two more uh, but also we are seeing which is also a good thing and uh, uh, look uh, the consolidation the finally so which is uh, which was a lacking right our companies right. were not doing ipos uh, investors were stuck so that is solved now our companies were not buying other companies in country consolidation was not happening then byju's has shown the way there so i i think the entrepreneurs are living in a golden era right what what could not uh, what what is the problem right now right there is no problem right so there are only opportunities at this point of time when i started internet 1998 we could hit here the bits when they'll hit the modem tuck 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 we had to build our own server so i think uh, we are all fortunate everyone on the panel uh, to be living in this very very lucky and golden era of indian digitalization uh, i am so so optimistic so everything has got digitalized from books 
to i think even uh, soap will get digitalized i think soon <laughs> we'll have digital baths so everything is possible today right and uh, 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 so i think those are some of the thoughts that i share i think i am so particularly very excited about b2c i think what has happened is that uh, indian women indian entrepreneurship has got liberated with b2c manufacturing which has become contract is easily accessible to people so it's now liberated the creative economy to become uh, not be hindered by the lack of either access to distribution or access to manufacturing or access to capital so all three uh, things are now creating a situation where i think million new brands can come and around those brands discovery platforms can come uh, fintech platforms can come which will solve the problem of that those platforms delivery platforms will come which will be again new age uh, so a lot of new massive opportunities are being opened uh, and face of digital and digital and and the beauty of india is that only any industry you take 1 to 20% digitalization so yeah. it's still a lot of white spaces so thanks a ton for that very uh, encouraging uh, note to all of us as entrepreneurs here uh, representing the capital market cities uh, so I'll, i'll i'll just move on and bring in rohit at this point because uh, i think rajesh you also mentioned about solving for problems you know like micro payments etc i think when we talk about this entire move and the latent opportunity uh you know we are also talking about uh, you know so from a sugar sugar box perspective we had a brief conversation earlier about uh accessibility reliability and affordability of content uh through devices and the next wave of voice and video in commerce and uh, are we ready and uh, the great stuff that you guys are doing in that space uh, some some uh, i had some really interesting thoughts from you so would love for you to share it with the audience Uh, thanks, thanks, Tavi. So I think uh, you know very similar to what the entire conversation has has been. I think we are also living in the in the golden era of telecom in India, right? Uh, as consumers, I think uh, dirt cheap data prices, uh, everything is available. Uh, however, it's a golden age for consumers, right? If you look at the internet economy or the internet ecosystem in India, it's probably their worst years, uh, and we don't know how long it's going to last, right? Uh, so the big macroeconomic challenge that's happening on the on the digital ecosystem front right now right is uh, you probably have the top 100 to 300 million people connected really well in india that's the those are the people that everybody focuses on those are the people that we all talk about uh, and that is where uh, you know the opportunities are far far larger than constraints uh, majorly from the spending capacity affordability uh, of what these people can actually spend on connectivity uh and also the density in in where in the places where these people are located so it's easier to connect them right uh but the big problem when it comes to the next billion people or the next 5 600 million people is they are in places where affordability from a geographic standpoint is a big challenge and the second is you know let's talk about the the monumental debt of the telecom industry uh even if you say i want to increase the arpu from i don't know 150 160 rupees to 250 rupees right which is what is the industry wide phenomenon of uh, break even in the telecom ecosystem uh, the expectation is that probably 2 300 million out of the 700 million internet users would drop off right they won't be able to afford it uh, and we are still just talking about the 700 million people that have come online in the last four years we are not even talking about the remaining 3 400 million uh, who still haven't even reached right uh, so this is really what we are going through from an internet infrastructure perspective right uh, and everything that we talk about we talk about digitalization we talk about iot coming in uh, we talk about agri tech right uh, more and more technology requires more and more requirements of infrastructure right you, the moment you talk agri tech you're talking about uh, you know uh, edge clouds you're talking about edge compute you're talking about uh, very very low latency networks none of this is available right how does all of this work uh, at a core infrastructure level and then the most important question to always ask is what is the sweet spot of economics wherein it is affordable and reliable for the user as well as sustainable and viable for the ecosystem right uh, and that is where what we saw is there are multiple problems that this really large black hole call as the internet ecosystem faces right it uh, one it has fragmentation of of uh, stakeholders right from the 
cloud company is coming down to the isps right there are many many different entities that lie in between there uh, and then the second big problem that we saw was the the model for the internet ecosystem to make money right so if i take a step back you know go back 20 years uh, the at&ts and the verizons were the rulers right they were the 100 billion dollar companies uh what's happened over the last 10 20 years is it is no more those guys who are the big tech companies it's the googles and the amazons and the facebooks uh, that have built billions or trillion dollar companies on top of this infrastructure right and so today the big question mark is who connects the next billion users right uh, do the infrastructure guys have any incentive in connecting the next billion users uh, they are actually happier getting into economy businesses so that they are able to become a google or a, or a amazon or a facebook uh, which is what geo is trying to do uh or the next question that comes in is uh, then does the does the onus of connecting the next billion users actually lie with the big tech guys uh, which is what google facebook and everybody is trying to do getting into infrastructure ventures of their own right uh, and the opportunity that we saw is there's a two fold problem the first problem is the way that data is distributed in the first place uh everything lies inside data center and that in itself reduces the the uh, you know the disruption that can be created from a low latency or an edge compute perspective so the first thing that we did is we miniaturized the entire infrastructure so that the whole internet infrastructure itself can be distributed right today we're talking about a micro cloud that can be installed on a train on a bus on a plane uh, or even inside a village so that connectivity can be enabled for them via existing local area networks that are out there uh and then the second thing that we did is we said hey can we change the revenue model in which these local transactions work uh and get the internet economy outside the you know number of subscribers in an area multiplied by the average revenue of the subscribers uh to start creating more uh, disruptive revenue models that are symbiotic for uh you know the users the applications as well as the as the internet service providers so that is what the that's the second problem that we work on so today when we go to a village what ends up happening is the guy the, the user at the village may not be able to afford a 2 3 or a 500 rupee internet connection uh, he is happy or buying a 10 rupee a day kind of a pack uh, but we are we are able to work with internet services uh, like ott apps like e commerce apps uh, you know like social media apps to create these user connects uh, to figure out different ways of monetization and then sharing that revenue with the internet ecosystem so that that village starts becoming profitable uh, from a connectivity standpoint right and then multiple different digitalization use cases come in as we go forward so now you have a very low latency very high availability and reliability network that's available in a particular village how can you not now start exposing this out for other iot applications like agritech how can you start outsourcing this for uh, you know Uh, also becoming the last mile delivery leg for let's say a satellite company like a starlink or a one web uh, so on and so forth right so that's that's typically the the wide so whereas everybody is trying to solve let's the way i put it the front end problem of the digital universe i think we are focused on the back end problem sure sure no you guys uh, keep going so that you know all of us as entrepreneurs in the digital economy can uh, continue to see it explored you know for users as well as businesses Right. Thanks for that viewpoint. I'd uh, like to bring in uh, Pramila at this point. Uh, the, the, you know, uh, sorry, it took a while to get to you, but uh, in in what we've picked up uh, from uh, Koo is, you know, I've heard uh, analogies like India's answer to Twitter, the voice of India across languages. So we are talking about content digitalization. You're coming to, uh, from the customer or the consumer voice perspective. Uh, content moderation you know that's an interesting one that i'd like to hear your thoughts about uh, and and that has lasting uh, last thoughts on this uh, for lack of time so we'd like to wrap up with uh, your views of from here sure thing so one is uh, you know who uh, focuses on getting the voices of india which is not on the internet right now right so very few social networks which actually bring out the true voice of india in an open network like facebook is a closed network whatsapp is a closed network uh twitter is an open network but not in local languages right uh, so that's what we are focusing on and there are multiple countries across the world which also behave this way uh and you know of course we we depend on the network to be formed and content to be generated by the folks who are in the platform right uh and 
you know, 99% of the content generated has no problem with, it, right? Uh, Everybody is well intentioned. They're coming and talking, and you know, very clean in their behavior. Uh, just like on the roads of India, uh, you know, most people will follow rules, and some people won't. And some people want to break rules, right? Uh, they will jump a traffic signal when they see a red light. Uh, so, for such scenarios, which will be one percent or so. Uh, there will be some clear case scenarios, which is black and white. Uh, pornography, black and white. Everybody has a uniform, uh, has an universal definition of what pornography is. Nobody will say, okay, this is not porn and this is porn, right? So those cases are very easy to handle. You can build uh, models around identifying it automatically and taking it down, right? Then there are enough uh, pieces of content which will be, you know, less than 0.5 percent of the total creation on the platform where there will be divided opinions on what is right and what is wrong. Now, those are places where a social media intermediary like who, uh, you know, when the social media intermediary takes a judgment call, you get into trouble. Like, and that's why Twitter has gotten into trouble because they take judgment calls on what is right and wrong. And I think a fresh approach uh, would be to actually, you know, see what the law of land, what the community, uh, says and go about it accordingly, right? So, so that you stay true to what you are, which is a social media intermediary. You are there to enable voices to come onto the internet. Now, the country that you operate in does not uh, has a rule against saying something that has to be respected, whether it is offline or online. So, the lines between how you behave online and how you behave off- offline has to be blurred and has to be brought together, right? So just because you're online doesn't mean you can act more rogue than you would do offline, right? Right. Uh, so I think a fresh perspective on how to treat uh, behavior online, I think is what we are bringing onto the table. So it is beyond, you know, so it, it might be more difficult for a 15 year old company uh, in social media to do it, but a you know, 15 month old company can definitely bring in a fresh perspective. Excellent. Thanks for those thoughts there. And uh, maybe the uh, event organizers could come in. Let us know if we have more time. I guess we are overshot. So uh, thanks, everyone, uh, for those wonderful thoughts. Uh, look forward to keep in touch. Uh,